Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Justin Cram. Justin is an expert in the archaeology of prehistoric Polynesia and conducts pioneering fieldwork on some of the most remote islands in the Pacific. He's also a zooarchaeologist, studying the relationship between past humans and the animals and ecosystems they interacted with. My name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Hey, Justin, thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So I think the first thing I wanted to ask is why Polynesia and uh, why the really remote parts of Polynesia <laughs> that you work in? Uh, it really started when I was an undergraduate. I was doing work in Michigan. I went to Central Michigan University as an undergrad, and uh, I was a McNair scholar there, um, which, if you don't know, McNair is a, uh, a program that helps uh, underprivileged students succeed and in, uh, in their in their path toward grad school really and at one point we went on this McNair retreat which was um, a wonderful experience a little bit strange we basically went to a vineyard and we stayed in this cabin in this vineyard and we um, it was kind of this intensive workshop of figuring out where your life is gonna go and uh, we didn't really know that was what it was going to be, but that's yeah. what it was. And we were given basically 24 hours to write a proposal for what our graduate research would be. Now, keep in mind, I'm a junior in undergrad at this point, and yeah. so I didn't really have a strong idea of what I was going to do. So it forced me to kind of sit awake at night, literally on the porch of this cabin, and think about what it was that was really interesting me in archaeology. I started thinking about resource scarcity and climate change and all of these different things that apply to archaeology in kind of weird ways. And whether it was exhaustion or, or what, uh, by the time morning came, I had written a proposal that I wanted to work on islands. And I had no idea what that meant. Um, so I went back to Central Michigan and I talked to my advisor there and said, hey, I was thinking, you know, the, these questions about islands are really interesting about how people get there, how they get their resources, how they get their food, how they do all these things. And he was like, oh, well, you know, you should talk to another professor here, Carmen White, who, um, who works in uh, the South Pacific. And she teaches a course on the cultures of the South Pacific, and this was a uh, cultural anthropology course. So I went and talked to her, and I took her course, and within a few weeks of, you know, nagging her after every class and just, you know, picking her brain about everything, she was like, well, you know, you should do your field school in Oceania. And so we started trying to figure out how that might work. She found a contact from University of Hawaii by the name of Barry Rowlett, who teaches a field school in uh, the Marquesas Islands, which is in French Polynesia, yeah. a very remote part of uh, East Polynesia, on the island of Tawata, in the village of Vaitahu, and the site was Hanamiai. And uh, she basically said, hey, just email this guy and see if he is teaching the field school this year. So... I emailed him and one thing led to another and a lot of grant writing took place to pay for this trip out to the middle of the South Pacific. I remember the granting agencies spent something like 3500 just to get to Tahiti. Man. And then yeah. from there, there was another flight up to Tawata. I was able to get out there for six weeks with, with Barry um, from University of Hawaii and a few other uh, really engaged students. And we excavated this amazing site called Hanamiai Dune and uh, lived with the people. And I was able to do a little bit of cultural work while I was there, just interviewing people about their fishing practices and comparing that to how... Um, you know, fish hooks looked in the past and what what fish they were targeting and things of that nature. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. So by the time I was ready to apply for grad schools, I applied to work with anyone I could find who was an expert in islands um, anywhere in the world. And I wound up at the University of Georgia working with Victor Thompson and Betsy Wrights and... Um, and I really just um, started asking everyone, you know, 
what's a what's a, a great place to address these questions of resource scarcity and things like that that mm-hmm. I'm trying to uh, that I've been trying to think about since that McNair retreat. You know, I had a couple people suggest to me the Cook Islands, and um, I looked into the research, and there hadn't been a ton done in the Cook Islands, and. For whatever strange reason, uh, the University of Georgia's library had a um, a collection of books, which is the Bishop Museum collection from Hawaii. Just these, just countless ethnographies and ethnologies about different islands in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. And so I started looking through them, and I found this one called The Ethnology of Manahiki and Rakahanga by an author who uh, went by Sir Peter Buck. His birth name was Terangi Roa, which is his New Zealand Maori name. And it just it detailed um, some really interesting things about these two islands, Manahiki and Rakahanga. Yeah. Uh, the first was that they were considered like um, sibling islands, like they were connected. And as he starts talking about the connections. He mentions this practice of migration where people would live entirely on Rakahanga and then migrate to Manahiki when they needed to for, um, or when their resources became scarce, they would switch islands. And, um, I'd never seen anything like this. That migration that's called Tamutu. Yes. I, I would later, find a couple of scarce references to the word tamutu and there was a lot of argument about how to spell it and i got together with like uh some indigenous leaders there and you know decided all right we're going to go with this spelling yeah um but essentially um what tamutu was was this migration it was the word given to uh, moving from Rakahanga to Manahiki for the purpose of conserving resources uh, and allowing a very large population to live on very small islands. It's like really, really small islands. I think I read in one of your papers something like 9.5 square kilometers. Yeah, that's, that's combined. Um, that is insanely small. <laughs> when When reading about these islands, I had the image of a lifeboat in my head. They're, they're so small and the swamp taro pit fields and, and the channels they built to trap fish only only added to the feeling in my head of, of life that barely rises above the waterline. Yeah, so that's one of the really interesting things um, because a coral atoll is essentially just a ring of coral reef that once surrounded a volcano. Mm-hmm. Only when you have periods where you have sea level fall can coral atolls come into existence. Right, because they're going to be right at the surface level, but once that sea level drops, they become exposed. Mm -hmm. And then wave action can deposit sediment and things like that. Yeah, so it wasn't until just a few thousand years ago that we have a drawdown, a a fall in the sea level, that allowed all of the coral atolls of East Polynesia to become exposed. And then we start to see life you know, take root on these places. And it's really not known exactly how long that process takes for, mm-hmm. like, a forest to develop. Yeah. That's something that was kind of counterintuitive to me at first reading it because I I guess I... My only understanding of sea level change over the last 15,000 years is the uh, increase in sea levels at the end of the last Ice Age and... And beyond that, I just kind of assumed that it was either flat or maybe slightly rising globally since then. Um, but I guess there's like regional variation or, or... Yeah, so there's regional variation even in the Pacific itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and we go through periodic changes um, just as a planet. Um, so right now, as you would assume, we're in a period of sea level rise. And so these atolls are facing threats right now, right? Yeah. Uh, the higher sea level goes, the uh, the less livable they are. Um, once the uh, the fresh water on the island becomes in, uh, inundated with salt water, you wind up with the coconut trees dying, the right. other plants dying. Is there any fresh water on these islands? So not in the way you and I might think of fresh water being stored. Mm-hmm. Um, what they have is something called a, a Gibbon-Herzberg freshwater lens. 
And what that means is that coral atolls are extremely porous. So you can think of them like a sponge. Yeah. Now, when you have freshwater rainfall onto that, it's going to permeate through the coral, but it's going to sit on top of the denser salt water. Today, I haven't encountered anyone using that freshwater lens for anything other than uh, growing plants. Um, I've never seen anyone use it for drinking um, because everyone basically has rain catchment these days. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the liquid you drink actually ends up coming from coconuts. Uh, but the, uh, the freshwater lens allows the coconut trees to grow. It allows mm -hmm. the puraka, that swamp taro that you mentioned, um, it allows those pits to grow and it allows certain species that like a brackish environment to, uh, to thrive. And even by the standards of Polynesia, one of the, the very last regions of the world to be colonized, Manahiki and Rakahanga are still colonized late, right? Starting with the Lapida and Tonga and Samoa around 900 BC, what did the process of filling up the rest of the Pacific actually look like? It happens in a few stages, right? Between Western Polynesia first and, 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 and then there's the remote stage, the, the East Polynesian stage. Is that a Good yeah, right that's, a, that's a good way to think of it. Uh, basically, when we have the Lapita, they come in to Tonga and Samoa, mm -hmm. um, kind of what we refer to as West Polynesia today. And yes, th these are larger islands. And once you get to these islands, there's a pretty big open water gap before you get to any more islands um, in the area we would call East Polynesia. Yeah. So people came to Tonga and Samoa. They settled there. They grew their population. They developed new traditions mm -hmm. uh, over what we think is about 2,000 years. And then we have this push out into East Polynesia um, and just this kind of massive expansion of people. And we wind up with places as far flung as Hawaii and Rapa Nui or Easter Island or yeah. Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, uh, being uh, inhabited by people for the first time. And also during this time period, kind of everything in between is mostly inhabited as well. So mm -hmm. all of what we now think of as the Cook Islands yeah, um, and French Polynesia, which is five large island groups. Yeah. Um, so places like the Society Islands, which is where Tahiti is, uh, the Marquesas, the Gambiers, the Tuamotos, the Australs. Um, they all become inhabited. Now, it seems like the current models we have suggest that the larger islands were probably taken up first. Mm -hmm. So places like Tahiti, places like Rarotonga and the southern Cook Islands that we don't have solid dates for that yet. Um, and then it's likely that the coral atolls or the more marginal places like Manahiki and Rakahanga and even up into some of the really marginal islands like the Line Group and the Phoenix Group, which are um, north of the uh, of Manahiki, Rakahanga, north of the Marquesas. Yeah. They're what we refer to as mystery islands for the most part. Um, and those are islands where people arrived... They lived there for a period and then abandoned the islands. Oh, really? And it's likely that there's some threshold of habitability that was crossed where it just wasn't worth staying there. Surely Manahiki and Rakahanga are close to that threshold. I have to imagine that if not for the very particular cultural systems that they developed, that they wouldn't have been able to survive where they do. It's, it's possible. Um... The choices that were made by the people who lived there seem to have been a driver in their ability to promote sustainability. Um, there's, a, there's a tradition throughout um, a lot of Polynesia and into some of the other parts of the Pacific. It goes by different names if you go into um, different areas. But in East Polynesia, it's referred to as Raui and, of course, there's a lot of languages spoken out there, so it will uh, it'll change. But essentially, it's a resource prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy I like to use is hunting season for us. So we here in the States try to conserve our resources, our 
our moose, our deer, our, yeah. you know, wherever you are. So we try to conserve our resources by placing a, a prohibition on them, right? You can't go after moose for most of the year. You can't go after deer for most of the year. Uh, you only open that resource up for hunting season. Well, yeah. Raui is pretty similar, but it's often not just applied to one resource, but it'll be re- applied to a area. So in the case of the Tamutu, the migrations between Manahiki and Rakahanga, it seems that the Raui was changed a bit, and now it became applied to an entire island. So you would have, say, Manahiki under protection. Mm-hmm. You can't go there. You're not allowed to set foot on the island, let alone take its resources. But once the leaders, the chiefs, um, lifted that that prohibition, opened hunting season, per se, the people could go to Manahiki, utilize those resources as they needed. And some people listening may be imagining hunter-gatherers, but while they were fishermen, ancient Polynesians were also horticulturalists, right? Yes, um, um, so they would have um, been, they would have been growing a number of plants. Um, some that we think of more in the garden sense, right? Like, mm-hmm. like taro, um, a specific type of swamp taro uh, that's referred to as puraka. Um, they would have dug large uh, horticultural pits into that freshwater lens of the atoll so that those plants could get the fresh water they needed and grow. Uh, but they also would have been growing large groves of coconuts, probably selecting specific varieties. Mm-hmm. The oral traditions that um, that talk about uh, Manahiki and Rakahanga before people arrived um, describe the first person to ever visit the islands, um, a man named Huku. And Huku arrived, and he, when he got there, the land was Ha which means desert, and that it was, um, and I, I'll put the air quotes up, it was scarcely above the face of the sea. Now, to me, that um, that indicates that maybe we're in that time period where sea level is coming down and the atolls are emerging. Mm-hmm. Not long after it first emerged above the waves. Yeah, and so there wouldn't have been much there. And the story of Huku really is talking about a man who is going to this place. He's seeing a ring of land that is desert and he is going to plant the first coconuts as the story goes and so he plants the first coconuts and leaves um and he waits he doesn't actually uh return he sends his kin uh his uh i may get this wrong his granddaughter Mm -hmm. and her husband her partner to uh to go back and claim the islands which should now have coconuts um, so that's kind of where the, uh, the origin of people on the islands is said to come from. And it ties in so closely with, uh, with this farming, right, with yeah. this horticulture, because tree crops are extremely important in Polynesia. And so when is this first arrival on Manahiki and Rakahanga really taking place? They, they must be on the tail end of when any islands in Polynesia are being first settled, right? Yeah, so we think that, um, like I, I mentioned, we don't have great dates for Rarotonga and the Southern Cook Islands, but we, the oral history suggests that Manahiki and Rakahanga were inhabited from Rarotonga. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same goes for New Zealand. Their oral traditions say that they're from Rarotonga as well. Um, so we think that it's inhabited after Rarotonga, likely after Tahiti. Mm-hmm. Um, our dating efforts have shown uh, dates uh, as old as, we'll say conservatively, about uh, 1200 AD. Mm -hmm. Uh, So pretty recently. um, That's a a big gap. I think people also rarely think about the scale chronologically of of Polynesian history in the sense of from, from the first sites at La Paja and Tonga being contemporary with the founding of Carthage um, or, or the the Olmec heads at Laventa to to this being the high Middle Ages um, in Europe and and say the uh, kind of the the height of the ancestral Puebloan period um, yeah in, in the American Southwest that's that's uh, 2,000 years 
of the gap there. Um, and for a long time, researchers didn't believe it that it was that big of gap of a gap and there was this uh, debate between um the uh the settlement histories uh where there was a long settlement history and a short settlement history some believed that people only stopped in west polynesia for about a thousand years before yeah. pushing into the uh more remote parts of the pacific and others fought for the long pause uh, which was two thousand years give or take um, now we're, I, I think we're pretty confident that it was the long pause as we don't have uh, really anything other than a few kind of uh, anomalous dates that might suggest people in these areas uh, on the shorter chronology. But yeah, one of the leading arguments is that people got to West Polynesia and they had kind of reached the limit of expansion that the population could handle. You're getting to a point where everyone has new land. Yeah. So was there a point in pushing further? Um, but we really don't know. Uh, we What we do know is that in that time period, things changed. Um, the population of Tonga and Samoa certainly grew. Mm -hmm. Um their cultural practices changed somewhat from what we see in the more Western Pacific. Um, and we see different forms of social organization emerging. And so um, if we think about the idea of the quintessential Polynesian chiefdom, right, that, uh, that archaeologists have talked about for ages, um, we think that that's the period where this, uh, this kind of system of ascribed power uh, really came into the form that we would see it in in other parts in Pol of Polynesia. Mm -hmm. What did their social life look like? Right, so it is uh, somewhat complicated in that when, if we, if we look at the oral histories, we have people first arriving on mm -hmm. the islands and then a population expanding out. And it's likely that there was interaction with other island groups and people were exchanging genetics and yeah. and whatnot. Um, but the oral histories suggest that everyone came from one family and that they expanded out. And eventually uh, that family uh, would kind of not fracture or anything of that nature, but like fission into kind of different lineages mm -hmm. from different sons. Yeah. And... Um, and so those lineages are thought to have uh, kind of established their own territories on Rockahonga. And when I say this, I'm talking about um, they're establishing their territories on the islet of Te Kainga, which is on Rockahonga. It's just one of the small islets that make up the, the ring of coral. Now, this islet is only 300 meters across. It is very <laughs> small. Um, but it... It's said that the uh, that everyone lived on that islet, uh, that was the village, and um, that they would eventually kind of fission into different kind of housing clusters within the village. Mm -hmm. And when we go to Manahiki, we don't just have one village like Rakahanga. We have a bunch of little villages. Now, we don't know if people were moving back and forth uh, in these really early periods or if this was just kind of an expansion. Um, but by the time we get to the early 1600s, we start to see a lot of upheaval. Now, this could be due to environmental catastrophe, which we have reason to believe that a, uh, a large wave, possibly a uh, cyclonic storm surge or a tsunami hit the island, um, at least hit Manahiki, uh, where we have large deposits of clean white marine sand. Um, and at the same time, we have oral histories from another island nearby, Puka Puka, that suggest that this is what happened. Um, but also, we have over on Rakahanga at this time, we have the arrival of Pedro Fernandez de Quiros. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be the first European contact in the area. And there is still some debate if this was Rakahanga, but I'm pretty well convinced at this point that it was. Um, he arrives on this island that he describes and his men describe um, that matches Rakahanga quite closely. Um, they talk about dogs, which um, they would have had at this time. And they talk about the people and some of their you know, behavior. Mm 
But Kiros, like many explorers of his time, um, didn't handle, um, uh, let's say, cross-cultural miscommunication very well. And within, um, I think it was within a day of arriving, uh, his men were slaughtering islanders. So at this point, we have this, uh, this right, we have environmental, we have social upheaval occurring. Mm-hmm. And what we see archaeologically is an abandonment, or at least partial abandonment of the villages on Manahiki, and a expansion of the village at Taikainga, where they're pushing out to the most marginal bits of Taikainga. And so at this point, if we look at the oral histories and the genealogical records, we get a rough estimate of when they change from the single chiefdom to the dual chiefdom. Yeah. And so what happens with that is, and I believe this happened right around this time period where all this upheaval is occurring, um, a, another individual who was very re- closely related to the chief, um, but he was connected to one of the other kind of sub-lineages, uh, he goes on this essentially a quest in the story to um, get a a cure for a disease that is affecting the population. And he goes to Manahiki and he gets this, uh, I believe he gets this coconut that he brings back to cure the disease. Now, is this disease a metaphor for the Spanish arrival or just the overall death that's occurring from all of these different sources? Mm -hmm. Or did a Spanish disease affect the people? Um, there are a lot of things, you know, that are really me speculating at yeah, this point. Yeah. But uh, it's a really interesting story to think about. And because of his actions, um, the people push back against their chief and say, we want him to have equal power. Hmm. And so they kind of separate the chiefdom into these two facets. And they both have um, both political and um, spiritual control. Um, so they work together is the uh, hmm. idea. And this exists until, um, we'll say, we'll call it missionization, kind of the continued contact with Europeans that would occur right. something like 250 years after Kiros. Um, and so when the missionaries arrive in 1849, they document this system. Um, and they document the people moving back and forth between the islands in the Tamutu. This practice in particular was something I thought was really interesting. It seemed like an optimistic counterpoint compared with pessimistic perspectives on human interaction with the environment of things like the tragedy of the commons, this idea that that anything held as a commons is inevitably going to be overexploited and that humans can't help but but uh, mismanage and overuse their environment. Um, and instead, it, this made me think that people really can effectively steward resources what allowed them to succeed where where other societies have failed yeah so i argue in uh, in one of my papers that um it's flexibility the people of manahiki and rakahanga what what they're doing isn't necessarily completely novel it's building off of traditions that are practiced around the region so if the tamutu is an exaggeration of and uh a building off of Raui, right? Rather than say, let's put this uh, area, you know, this bay or something of that nature under protection, we're going to put the entire island under protection. Mm-hmm. Nobody's touching it until we absolutely need it. I was telling a so, friend about this and they were like, oh, it's like giant crop rotation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not, it's not far from that. And, you know, even today, um, you know, when I go out to these islands to work, I'll, uh, I'll say, oh, I'm going to go over to uh, Poria Islet, which is in the south of Manahiki, an islet that no one lives on. Mm-hmm. And I'll be, immediately be like, oh, no, you're not. Uh, that's <laughs> under Raui. You're not going there without special permission. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, they really held fast this idea of putting lands and resources under protection unless they're needed. And I think today, when we talk about things like ecological conservation, mm-hmm. Manahiki 
especially Manahiki, but Rakahanga as well, has like a thriving coconut crab population, which um, in other parts of the Pacific, those crabs have gone uh, gone extinct or they're extirpated from the islands. Yeah. I remember um, I was on Manahiki uh, one year and we were hunting coconut crabs for a celebration. So they lifted the raui and we were able to go in and, and catch these crabs. And we had some sailors there from neighboring islands in Kiribati who had come in on a, on a cargo ship. Um, and they were taken aback by the fact that we could eat coconut crab because they're so scarce on the islands that they mm-hmm. lived on that they would be arrested if they tried to eat a <laughs> coconut crab. Uh, so the protection system, to some extent, still works today and pro- provides these areas with, uh, with protection. And um, I don't know if it's selfishly speaking, but it also has helped to protect the archaeological sites because there's no development allowed in a lot of these places. No one's allowed to build on Te Kainga. No one's really supposed to go to Te Kainga without permission. Um, Same with a lot of the islets that we work on. Um, So they have been placed under this kind of ecological protection. um, And that protection has helped us preserve the archaeology as well your specialty of zooarchaeology really seems like it's perfectly married to this this interest in these remote island uh settings because it 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 seems to me they're one of the things they allow us to look at best is the human interplay with the natural world and the i think it was called um transported landscape yeah of species that we bring with us how that alters the local ecosystem, which elements of that transported landscape, which species manage to survive and to thrive, which ones kind of flicker out again after a while. And Um, why. And why, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's not a mistake that I ended up being a zooarchaeologist. That was never my intent. Um, I went to University of Georgia as a grad student and planned to work on, you know, uh, the islands of the South Pacific. And uh, when I settled on coral atolls, my advisor said to me, well, what are you going to look at? There's no stone on these islands. They're made of coral. So you're not going to look at lithics. Um, You're likely not going to have the preservation for wood. There's Mm -hmm. no metal. Um, Mm -hmm. There's no clay. So there's no pottery. Yeah. What are you going to look at? And the answer is bones and shell. Uh, those are the the two main materials that we can look at archaeologically. So, you know, that's why zooarchaeology really became a part of my life. Uh, because really, when you're looking at these sites, what you get is things that I had kind of already studied as an undergrad with uh, shell. Yeah. In shell tools, shell adzes, is shell fish hooks. Um, then you get the shells that are left as remains of food, of course. You get the bones that are turned into tools or made into, uh, or are the remains of, of food waste as well. Um, and then beyond that, really what you're studying is maybe some coral and um, a lot of charcoal. So those really became my specialties, so archaeology and radiocarbon dating. What is the the transported landscape that people were taking with them? And and I guess in particular with with dogs as a case study, what what sort of patterns have you been finding in what they what they do to a place where they can last, where they don't seem to last? Yeah, so the transported landscape, and I won't go into all the plants because there there are more <laughs> um lesser known plants that yeah. uh that got brought with them. Uh, but as far as plants go, you mostly have uh, forms of taro. Uh, you would have coconuts, of course, uh, different varieties. Uh, there are a lot of varieties of coconuts out there, and some of them are better for eating. Some of them are better for drinking. Um, I am still a coconut novice, and whenever I go, you know, and I'm out there in the Pacific, and I say, oh, I'll go grab some coconuts for us to drink, and I come back with coconuts, everybody just looks appalled at my <laughs> choices of coconuts. But yeah, so you have you have taro, you have uh, coconuts, uh, you would have breadfruit, which is kind of like a potato-like fruit that grows on very large trees and is quite delicious. 
a staple of um, many Polynesian diets. And then with animals, you have you basically have four major animals. Um, the only four kind of land animals that are brought with people are pigs, dogs, chickens, and rats. The pigs, the dogs, and the chickens are probably on purpose. The rats... They're hitchhiking. Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're not, you know, many, many cultures do eat rats. Uh-huh. Um, but the Pacific Island rat, the ratus exulans, the exalted rat, is typically quite small, and I, I can't mm-hmm. imagine it being part of a lot of meals, but mm-hmm. in some places I'm sure it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the other three um, have really interesting histories, the pigs, the dogs, and the chickens. Um, and they've spread throughout the Pacific with the first colonizers. In many cases, we will have early archaeological sites with Uh, all three of them, Mm -hmm. Um, but we often get sites or island groups as a whole that have one of the three or two of the three. Oh, interesting. Um, And so they don't always... It's not always a package deal. Yeah, it's not always a package deal. Um, My work has focused on dogs. Um, The reason why it's focused on dogs is because the ethnology of Manahiki and Rakahanga that was written... Um, long before my research, has a line in it that says that pigs, the pig, the dog, and the chicken were unknown before uh, missionization, essentially. Hmm. Saying that the people on Manahiki and Rakahanga did not have pigs, dogs, or chickens. Uh, They had rats. The rats made it. But when I was excavating on uh, on Manahiki in 2017... I um, found them. Yeah, it was really, it was one of those situations where I was, I had my field team at the time consisted of my wife, uh, Sarah, and um, I had two local assistants at that time, uh, which were a husband and wife couple, um, Haumata uh, and her husband, Thomas, who were uh, out there with us most of the time. Hamata was always with me, but Thomas sometimes. Um and so I, I forget exactly what was going on, but we were uh, we were we were digging, and my wife Sarah was on the screen, and she said, "Hey, come here! I want to show you this tooth." And I, I think I was down in a unit or something, and I, yeah. said, I said, "Just just put it in the bag. I'll, I'll look at it later," as archaeologists tend to do. And uh, <laughs> I get back to the house that night, and she was like, "Hey, you never looked at that tooth." And so I get it out of the bag and. Being a zooarchaeologist, I immediately knew something was up. This was a premolar of a carnivorous mammal, and I, I knew that immediately. And so I start using my limited internet to send photos <laughs> back to the yeah. states, like, "Hey, is this is this a, is this a dog?" And it was almost immediately confirmed to be a dog. And I should state that, being an archaeologist, you know, um, we get contamination. And contamination all the time. Why wouldn't I think, oh, this was a modern dog that contaminated the sample? Mm-hmm. Well, dogs are illegal on Manahiki and Rakahanga today. So there are no dogs there. Uh, yeah. And someone bringing a dog there would be very rare, and it would likely be killed or taken off the island immediately. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I was really excited, and we went back the next day and excavated and nothing. Nothing that looked like a dog finished the excavations on Manahiki. Nothing that looked like a dog. And so I, I was very confused at this point, thinking we must have had some kind of contamination. I don't know where it came from. We get to Rakahanga, and uh, we're going to do a, a few months of field work on Rakahanga at this point. And the first shovel test, there was uh, essentially the entire jaw of a dog. And wow. so... As time goes on, as we're excavating on Rakahanga, we're just finding dog after dog after dog. So then the question is, when were they extirpated? Um, right. We we did a lot of work to directly date the dog teeth, to date material found with the dog teeth, um, and to figure out the ways we needed to go about uh, calibrating these radiocarbon dates. Um, and we determined that it that our earliest dogs show up very shortly after people. 
stayed there for a few hundred years at least and then were extirpated. This mirrors what we see around the Pacific. So is there a certain factor that predicts where these invasive species will struggle to survive? Yeah, it, when we look at we look at different factors uh, like island size, distance between islands, known trade connections between islands, we find that the one factor that really stands out is um, island type. So the the big high islands, as they're typically called, the volcanic islands and what we call Makatea Islands, which are uplifted coral, the likelihood of dogs surviving on high islands is much greater mm -hmm. than dogs surviving on coral atolls or other types of coral islands. Yeah. And so it's not like this this suite of domesticates that humans take with them will touch down on any island and immediately steamroll the local ecology and some of the species won't last and and yeah exactly uh, you know sometimes people would have brought a type of animal to an island and then realized that it was a mistake you know, dogs and pigs especially are very uh very destructive animals mm -hmm. um, they can destroy reef environments by foraging on the reefs they can oh so it could even be a conscious yeah decision. so they could be a conscious decision to wow. get rid of them um a analogy i'll use from more recent times on the island of mangaya in uh the southern cook islands there was a point where people uh in recent times um in the last couple hundred years introduced rabbits thinking that would be a great food source well they took over um and it took the people actively hunting down every single rabbit on the island Jeez. to get rid of them. Um, but it's also, you know, there is the possibility that the animals just couldn't survive for different reasons. Mm -hmm. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Tonga, there were plenty of dogs on, on Ewa, this, this island that I was on, and they were, you know, domestic. They were, people ate them, people used them as a garbage disposal, people used them to guard their property. But there were also lots of stray dogs, and, and I, I could imagine if people weren't actively maintaining that population in some way, them dwindling, especially in a place with little or no groundwater. And um, Yeah, but. and I'm imagining those dogs, because um, I've been to a lot of places in the Pacific, and those, those packs of strays never yeah. look good. Yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah they're always um, <laughs> right on the edge. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there, there's different reasons, and we, we honestly don't know wholly um, why uh, different islands would have success and others wouldn't. You know, other examples from uh, modern observation, I'll say, because this is anecdotal um, to my own experience, but I've seen it on multiple islands now, uh, where people introduce goats, and they think this goats are going to be a great food crop because they are on a lot of Pacific islands. Um, if you go to, say, the Marquesas, you'll likely eat a lot of goat. Um, but on coral atolls, there is some type of vegetation, I don't know what it is, that seems to be poisonous to them. Oh, wow. Because people always just find their goats dead when they let them graze. So it's, hmm. uh, you know, it's possible that on certain islands, there were certain, certain resources that were problematic for the animals they were trying to introduce, but we yeah. would need to do yeah. more research into that to know for sure. Do you think there are lessons that this kind of human interplay with the natural world in Polynesia, do you think there are lessons that people living in the Pacific today can take from it? Well, I think that... Uh, what's happening on Manahiki and Rakahanga today shows that um, the resilience can be uh, actively cultivated. That by looking at tradition, uh, looking at the traditions of the Raui and uh, resource prohibitions, the way people have gone about utilizing their landscape in the past, I think the people who live there now are, they're very connected to their past, they're very connected to their traditions, and they know how to use their landscape in a way that um, that keeps things running. You know, it's definitely not the idea of everything they do is correct or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. that they know that in the past, their flexibility has helped them uh, maintain their landscape and they know that if something changes that they can adapt with it and 
and that I think allows them to maintain a uh, a really great way of life out there. I think that's a a good note to end on. Um, thanks for taking the time for the interview. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh, this was really fun. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website, where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.